10 horrifying and vigorous monsters from Creepshow Reboot explored. In 2019, Shudder premiered Creepshow, an American horror anthology streaming television series. The series continues the 1982 film of the same name, ignoring the sequels Creepshow 2 and Creepshow 3, and consists of 17 episodes, each with two horror stories. On September 26, 2019, the series premiered. For aficionados of old school horror, especially those who adored the original Creepshow, there's a lot to enjoy here. Shudder's series keeps the same love for EC Comics, with scene transitions that mirror the paneled layouts and speech bubbles of the old pages. And yes, the creep himself returns as your esteemed host. We have no choice but to stand him because he's a practical puppet who's fantastic. All three seasons have been met with immense critical acclaim, and it is one of the most highly rated horror anthologies to have ever been made. But today, we're not here to talk about the stories that the various directors have given to us. Instead, we will take a look at the 10 most terrifying monsters that the anthology has presented us with. Do you have the creeps yet? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Cannibalistic Monsters Grey Matter Season 1 Episode 1 First Story The first episode of the first season kicks off with a bang! Grey Matter is based on a short story by legendary author Stephen King and adapted for the screen by Byron Willinger and Philip de Blas. The segment, directed by Greg Nicotero, tells the story of a father and son. After losing his wife, the father turns to alcohol to cope with his grief, with disastrous results. The story takes place on a dark and stormy night, when most of the community has either fled or boarded up their homes to stay safe from the storm. The young boy tells the story of his father's descent into alcoholism, until one day, his father consumed a bad can of beer, which probably contained a mutagen and has been slowly morphing into an inhuman blob-like monster who despises light and craves warm beer ever since. The boy, who was spying on him one night, saw his father eat a dead cat, prompting him to seek aid. The monster is gigantic in size and can be best described as slimy, oozy blob which is positively disgusting to see. Its jaw is massive and can consume humans whole. It eats not only dead animals, but also humans and can best survive in a hot environment which doesn't have any light. Not only that, the monster is also immensely strong and can multiply because it is a blob with no fixed shape. The son used to help his father by leading humans to the house to feed on, but the scariest part is that it can split right down the middle and multiply. The world might just be taken over by blob monsters, but at least you know how it happened. Werewolf, Bad Wolf Down, Season 1, Episode 2, First Story. This story follows Lawrence Talby. The commander of a butchered platoon of American soldiers, who flees to a French forest with his remaining men, Sergeant Quist, Private Rivers, and Doc Kessler, during World War II. The soldiers find shelter in an abandoned police station, only to learn that it is inhabited by a guilt-ridden werewolf. Before escaping, Quist locks the others in a cell. Soon, the station is encircled by Nazi soldiers, commanded by a vengeful Obersturmfuhrer seeking vengeance for the murder of his son by the soldiers. With no other options, Talby and his men take desperate measures to stay alive, allowing themselves to be transformed into werewolves. They slaughter their attackers, thanks to their newfound abilities. The werewolves are the monsters in question here, and boy were they terrifying to look at. If you came across one, you would definitely freeze on spot. These creatures are massive in size, much larger than a regular wolf, with shaggy hair and matted fur and long, dangerous fang-like teeth. They possess inhuman strength and speed while also walking on two legs and thus remain somewhat humanoid. They respond to the moon and can transform only when night falls. But what makes them scary is the five minutes of absolute carnage we see on screen as they destroy the enemy soldiers with no weapons and just their claws and teeth. One even rips the heart of the Nazi leader, but it looks like these werewolves were on the good side and continue having their human conscience. Lizard, 
The Finger, Season 1, Episode 2, Second Story. Clark Wilson, a lonely and unhappy man with a gloomy outlook on life, gathers lost and abandoned artifacts in this short, The Finger. He finds a mysterious severed finger in the middle of the street one day. He spills beer on the finger after bringing it home. Over time, the finger transforms into a bizarre lizard-like monster that he refers to as Bob. Clark and Bob get along remarkably well, but it appears that Bob has a soft spot for Clark as he begins hunting down and killing everyone who offends his new owner, then presenting Clark with their body parts as morbid offerings. Clark is confined to an asylum after the authorities discover him trying to dispose of the heads of his ungrateful stepchildren in his garbage disposal, after which he loses his mind and tells the audience that Bob loves him and will come for him. You know Bob. If he wants to come in, he'll come in. Bob loves me. If you're not a fan of reptiles, lizards probably already give you the creeps, but this one is much, much worse. I'm pretty sure even Australia doesn't house these species. The creature grew from one severed finger into a whole four-limbed reptile that was also sentient and alive, and as could be seen, had the capability to regenerate. The creature has weird, scaly skin, a long tail and bumps on a ridge on its back. Its head was much larger than its body and looked like an overgrown iguana, turtle hybrid of sorts. It was clear that this creature had gotten attached to the man that had saved him. The creature scurries around in a rather disturbing way and can kill with ease. With the help of its claws and mouth lined with dozens of sharp, pointy teeth, this one might even remind you of the stop motion used for the Sumatran rat monkey in Dead Alive and definitely scared the shit out of us. Grotesque Scarecrow, The Companion, Season 1, Episode 4, First Story. The Companion is the first story in the fourth episode of Season 1, and it is about a little child named Harold who runs away from his abusive sibling, Billy. Harold seeks refuge on an abandoned farm, where he discovers a hideous scarecrow that has come to life. He discovers that the scarecrow was made as a friend by a lonely farmer who later committed suicide. It was now hunting Harold down for intruding on his late creator's home. When he discovers the farmer's cane, he uses it to defend himself against the Scarecrow, learning that it has a psychological hold on the creature. This turn of events is exploited by Harold, who brings the Scarecrow back to his house and releases it on Billy as retaliation for his brother's abuse. The reason why this grotesque Scarecrow is on our list of top 10 villains in this anthology is because it is absolutely terrifying and very much alive and kicking. So it will hunt you down. The Scarecrow has protruding ribs, a skull for a face, and apart from regular human teeth, also has two large fangs on either side of its mouth. It is dressed in raggedy clothing with a top hat and comes to life when Harold pulls out the cane that was lodged in its chest to defend himself against Billy. The Scarecrow can also use its supernatural powers to wrap tree roots around objects and grab them along with being a murder-hungry creature. Walk past a field with Scarecrows at your own peril. You never know when one of them will come to life. Skin Crawlers, Season 1, Episode 6, First Story. An overweight man called Henry Quayle discovers Dr. Herbert Sloan's Skin Deep by Sloan, a remarkable new weight loss therapy in which fat cells from a person's body are liquefied and sucked out by a newly discovered and highly evolved kind of leech. The day of the therapy also happened to be the day of a significant once-in-a-lifetime solar eclipse. When the eclipse approached totality, it was realized that the alleged miracle cure had horrifying negative effects on those who experienced it. The larval leeches gorily burst from their bodies as a result of this. When Henry meets Dr. Sloan, he assures him that the leeches have been tested in every eventuality imaginable. Dr. Sloan's body breaks open and a giant tentacled leech attacks Henry. By smashing the leech with a vending machine, Henry is able to kill it. The skin crawlers are the monsters in question here, and they are rather disgusting. The main animals were said to be some form of evolved leeches found in swamps, and they were much longer, bigger, and stronger. They had a snappy mouth with teeth in them, along with having sharp ridges on its back. However, once the eclipse hit, smaller skin crawlers began bursting out of people's eyes and nose and any other open crevice of a human body, causing humans to explode and die a bloody death. Turns out, the leeches, which were only meant to suck away body fat, also reproduced within the human system, giving birth to thousands of little skin crawlers that thrived within a person's body before bursting out on Eclipse Day, killing everyone that ever underwent treatment. The biggest one emerged out of Dr. Sloan's body itself and had many tentacles, along with a massive mouth lined with dozens of sharp, pointy teeth. Best to lose fat the old-fashioned way, eh? Ah! 
Champy, a lake monster, by The Silver Water of Lake Champlain, Season 1, Episode 6, Second Story. Rose Phillips, an adolescent in 1984, laments the death of her father while seeking to track down Champ, the fabled monster who lives in Lake Champlain. She now sets out to find Champ by herself in order to prove that her late father's stories of seeing the creature were not the product of a lunatic's delusions. When she, her younger brother Joseph, and her boyfriend Thomas find what looks like Champ's body washed up on the lake's shore, she realizes that her father was correct all along, and she sets out to prove it to the rest of the world. This is Champy. This is what dad was looking for all of those years. She must, however, first defend herself against her cruel and vicious stepfather, who wants to take credit for the discovery. A much larger beast suddenly devours him whole when he gets violent. Champ's baby turns out to be the dead corpse, and she carefully drags her child's body back into the lake. Champ is a massive lake monster and in appearance is very similar to the Loch Ness Monster. It is a huge creature with a big, hefty body and a long neck which ended in a snake-like mouth with sharp teeth. It also has flippers and slippery skin, and its history is traced back to the dinosaur age. While this creature is largely thought to be calm and keeps to itself, which is why humans barely ever catch sight of it, when the time comes they can also attack viciously. Champ is humongous and her size gives a massive advantage over regular humans because of which she is able to pick a human up whole with her mouth. It's best not to go looking for creatures of the deep. They might have cute names like Champ and Nessie, but one bite and it's all over. Deadite, Public Television of the Dead, Season 2, Episode 1, Second Story. Claudia Aberlin, director of network programming at Pittsburgh's WQPS public television station, is compelled to cancel The Love of Painting with Norm Roberts so that Mrs. Bookberry's magical library can take its place. The episode is a nod to both PBS and The Evil Dead. Meanwhile, host Goodman Tappert welcomes Ted Ramey to the show during the taping of an episode of The Appraiser's Road Trip. Ted brings in the Necromonicon to be assessed, which he claims has been in his family for years. How did you come across this? Oh, well, it's, it's been in the family for years. Goodman opens the book and manages to recite aloud the ancient incantations within, turning Ted into a deadite who then kills Tapper, also turning him into a deadite. At the same moment, the demonic evil contained within the book is released, wreaking havoc on the studio and killing several employees, while Ted is possessed and murders Bookberry, turning her into a deadite. The Deadite is this story's featured monster, and they look like zombies with completely white eyes, decaying teeth, and a deep, hoarse voice. The Deadite also has the ability to float and fly in the air, along with having superhuman strength which is seen when they destroy the whole recording studio and kill multiple studio personnel. The Deadites are parasitic demons that infest on the souls of humans, and a human can be possessed by chanting an incantation from the ancient book. They are capable of possessing humans and making them do their bidding. It probably is a good idea to not read ancient books out loud. <laughs> Mutated Monsters, Pesticide, Season 2, Episode 2, Second Story. Harlan King, an exterminator, is called and taken to an abandoned factory where he meets Mr. Murdoch, who intends to demolish the plant and replace it with condos. Murdoch shows King a small squatting population on the land and informs him that they are the bugs he wants to get rid of. King initially refuses, but later enters the homeless camp to poison them. When he awakens one of the homeless and they attack him, King is forced to kill him in self-defense. And when another vial of poison is accidentally spilled into their stew, the rest of the homeless are also killed. King begins to have nightmares and hallucinations in which he is severely mauled and killed by various giant-sized pests, and he shrinks to the size of a cockroach as a result of his guilt. After that, he is killed by his therapist who thinks that she is squashing a roach. The mutated monsters start harassing him every waking and dreaming moment, and they are scary beasts. They are the gigantic versions of everyday pests, such as mice and other rodents, along with massive mosquitoes that suck the blood out of King. If creepy crawlies are your weakness, then this episode will have you at the edge of your seat at all times. The fact that these are huge and beyond human control make them even scarier. Small pests, like the regular fly, when enlarged, becomes a vicious monster, and the worst of them all is a giant venomous tarantula. Tentacled Monster, Within the Walls of Madness, Season 2, Episode 4, 
second story. Zeller, a graduate student presently jailed in a detention center, tells his appointed counsel Tara Cartwright about the events that led to his incarceration. Zeller had lately worked for the military at Install 511, a government research facility in Antarctica that investigated paranormal events. He had witnessed a gigantic, tentacled creature emerge from a rift in the wall and murder his colleague, graduate student Mallory, during a containment breach. He came in. He came in through the walls. Oh, Mallory. After being accused of murdering Mallory, Zeller discovered that his superior, Dr. Trollenberg, had been framing him for the crime as part of a plot to bring the Old Ones, a race of ancient, primordial, godlike entities, to Earth in order to reclaim it. He did this after discovering a strange, bone-like instrument that plays a frequency that opens interdimensional portals on an expedition. Then, gazing into one of the said portals, he goes insane, submitting to their powers. The monster that is our focus is the massive tentacled monster that breaches the facility. It has the ability to move through portals and has three large eyes, along with around 10 extremely strong and lethal tentacles, which it uses to strangle and kill humans. In fact, it almost looked like a much larger version of Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean. The tentacled terror is a trope that is recurring in the horror genre, and this episode seems like a homage to the trope people seem to love so much from movies like Deep Rising and Tentacles. No! Giant Spider. Okay, I'll bite. Season 3, Episode 3, Second Story. Elmer Strick is a quiet pharmacist serving time in prison for euthanizing his terminally ill mother. After it is revealed that he was involved in an altercation with fellow convict, Polish Frank Kowalski, he is denied release. While in jail, Elmer developed a fascination for spiders and has amassed quite a collection of them including a fairly enormous spider hiding under a loose block in his cell wall. He receives an anonymous letter complimenting his actions, as well as a parchment scroll from a Cairo library. Elmer realizes that the big spider lying behind the wall is a form of sacrament, the Egyptian mistress of dread, and that the scroll is the incantation for a sort of ritual involving her. In the end, Elmer is bitten by her, and he also transforms into a giant humanoid spider. If you have arachnophobia, or spiders in general give you the creeps, then this is where you skip the video forward, because it will make your skin crawl. The regular spiders that he keeps are already scary enough, but the giant one is something else. Sockman is easily five times the size of a regular spider, and when she bites Elmer as part of the ritual, he transforms into a gigantic one. Its body is made up of Elmer's dead face, and eight limbs sprout out of it, making it horrifying to look at. It traps people in its extremely strong webs and drains them of life. Fear of spiders? We suggest you run. Did these scare the shit out of you? Then you definitely need to go and watch one of the best horror anthologies of all time, Creepshow. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. I warned you. <laughs>